Hello everyone. Welcome to another Fresh Chapter Friday. I am introducing to you today to one of my absolute favorite series. It is the mystery series that is Trouble is a Friend of Mine. And it's by Stephanie Tromley. So what I loved about it was it really was a Veronica Mars-esque type of book. And I found out the author did intentionally have those vibes in the other series, um, two books that she did with these characters. There's a kind of Scooby-Doo related one, and then there's another one that's also related to another famous um, you know, detective story. Okay, so here we go. Trouble is a friend of mine, and I'm doing multiple chapters since they are super short. Of course I didn't like Digby when I first met him. No one does. He's rude. He doesn't ever take no for an answer, and he treats you like a book he's already read, and he knows the ending, just in case you yourself didn't yet. Now, if you're a normal 16-year-old like I am, and you spend half your time obsessing about the future and what you're supposed to be, and the other half reading about makeup diets and all the ways to change who you already are, then the stuff he hits you with is hard to take. Like Digby himself said, the truth is almost always disappointing. Not that I need him to tell me about the truth or disappointments. In the last six months, I went from living in an almost good part of Brooklyn to my parents divorcing and mom and me moving to River Heights, a small city in the armpit of upstate New York. Trust me, it's an even bigger lifestyle demotion than it sounds like. Here's my first confession. I hung out with cool people, sure. But looking back, I think maybe we were friends only because we were in the same classes and our parents all got divorced around the same time. Digby calls them circumstantial friends. Right place, right time. It was easy to be friends, and so we were. My friendship with Digby, on the other hand, well, circumstantially convenient, he does just show up after all, is not easy. Nothing with that guy ever is. At first I thought I hung out with him because I was bored and I wanted to get back at Mum for moving me here. Then I thought it was because he seemed so lost and alone all the time. But now I'm standing outside a house, wired with enough explosives to blow up our entire block into a pile of matchsticks, trying to figure out the best way to get back in, and I realize that, really, I'm the one who's been lost. But I'm jumping far too ahead. All this began on the first day of school, and we need to go back there for you to understand. Chapter 1 I'd been telling Mom to change the drained batteries in the doorbell since we moved in. The chimes were out of tune and dinging at half their normal speed. They sounded like a robot dying in slow agony. And now some Jack A was ringing it over and over. After five minutes of pretending nobody was home, I thought I was going to snap, so I answered the door. Nice bell, he said. He was my age, wearing a black suit that made him look even taller and skinnier than he already was. It was a hot morning, and he was sweating into the collar of his white button-down. He held a black book, and I would have thought he was a Jehovah Witness with a Bible, but I doubted that they wore sneakers when they came calling. His messy brown hair had probably been once pop star shaggy, but now it needed a real cutting. His sad brown eyes turned down at the corners, and he had a bored facial expression that I later realized was one of his main weapons in life. Sorry, not interested. Just to be safe, I yelled. It's no one, Mom. Just some guy selling something. Why are you pretending your mom's home? You're here alone. You guys drove off together, but you're back, and her car isn't. I'm guessing she dropped you off at school and you walked home, he said. Next time, fix sick and save her the gas. I tried another one. Dad! <laughs> you only had one car in the garage. The tires are squishy, by the way. The grass on your lawn isn't brown, and it's a foot tall. 
Recycling isn't sorted, and you know, the doorbell, he said. There's no dad in the picture. I was too shocked to deny it. What were you casing this place? Because I gotta tell you, we don't have anything nice. The following catalog ran through my head. Letter opener in the hall drawer. Knives on the kitchen counter. Poker by the busted fireplace in the den. And a collection of advice from Sexual Assault Prevention Day like Never let them take you to a second location. Casing the place? No. Well, technically, I guess I was casing around your house. But not your actual house, he said. Anyway, I've watched your photograph yourself every morning. What? You've been looking in my window? I need to see the photos, he said. Although, if you only take them at the same time every day, they probably won't tell me much because they never do anything interesting in the mornings. Then again, you never know. I'm calling the police. I slammed the door so hard, the doorbell started ringing on its own. Listen, my name's Digby. Here's my email address. He slid a small piece of paper under the door that said digby at therealdigby.com. Email me the photos if that's less freaky for you. Through the glass panel in the door, I saw him start to knock. So I grabbed the letter opener and I flashed it in and I'm gonna stab you kind of way. I guess I was convincing because he said, whoa, and he backed off. When he got to the sidewalk, he looked up to my bedroom window, then stared at the mansion across the street for a long time. And that wasn't even the weirdest thing that happened that day. I had just started as a junior at River Heights High, and I didn't know they phoned parents of absent students after the first period bell. They called it the Ferris Bueller Rule. Apparently, the school board made the new rule after a girl disappeared during summer vacation, Marina Jane Miller. TV news always used all three of her names. She had been kidnapped while friends were sleeping over in her room. They hadn't heard a thing. The whole of River Heights was freaked, especially the rich people, because Marina Miller was very rich. The school called Mom at work, and she called me, but when I didn't pick up, she rushed home, only to find me napping. Naturally, she had a mini conniption fit, but much worse than that was the fact that cutting school landed me in an early intervention meeting with 13 other kids who got busted that day, which is where I saw Digby again. Chapter 2. The truancy officer was a, a hard A man named Musgrave. He was the kind of man whom mom would say, Poor thing wasn't held enough as a baby. He sat us in a circle and slowly walked around the outside. When I was first summoned to the meeting, I didn't think that it was going to be a big deal. But Musgrave's black uniform and shiny badge were intimidating. Meanwhile, our guidance counselor who introduced himself as, Please call me Steve, stood in the middle of the circle handing out chocolate chip cookies that he picked for us. He'd also made Hello My Name is stickers. Mine said Zoe Webster in swirly red ink, like all the girls, and the boys were done in blue. Musgrave scowled when Please Call Me Steve offered him a cookie. Funnily, the two of them looked like evil twin good twin alike. Both were short, dumpy men with bad haircuts and red splotchy faces. But where Steve's was red with sunburn from riding his bike to work, Musgrave's was red from, I guess, drinking and rage. Musgrave was halfway through his threats about unexcused absences and summer school when Digby arrived. It had taken him maybe 20 minutes to wind up to his climax, so he was totally derailed when Digby sauntered in. You must think you're a funny guy almost missing a disciplinary meeting on truancy, Musgrave said. Grab your name tag and get your butt over here. Digby had to write his own tag, which he did in swirly red letters, and then he sighed and dragged a chair to the circle. The metal legs screamed the entire way. 
The other truants clapped and they laughed. To my horror, Digby parked himself next to me and greeted me like we'd planned to sit together. I tried to look saintly and refused to acknowledge Digby's muttered asides. He stage whispered things like, It's 9 a.m. He smells like jerky. Discuss. And do you think it's fun to stay at the YMCA in that outfit? I sat frozen, but Musgrave threw me the same evil stare he pointed at Digby. As far as he was concerned, we were in it together. Finally, after repeating the policy on truancy and summer school twice more, Musgrave ended the meeting. Okay, everybody, please call me Steve, said. Please come and leave your information on the sign-up sheet here. Make sure you take a look and help yourself to some more snacks. Give Pepitas a chance. Meanwhile, Musgrave cornered Digby and me. How's it going, Harlan? Digby said to him. Welcome back to River Heights, Mr. Digby, Musgrave said. I haven't gotten your file from your school in Texas. Did they teach you manners there, or are you and I going to have problems? Harlan and I go way back. Before this demotion, when he was an actual police officer, Digby said. Guess that answers my question about manners, Musgrave said. Ah, oh, don't be sad, Harlan. You should learn to see the positive in this new job. After all, I believe children are our future, Digby said. You! will call me Mr. Musgrave. And you, Zoe Webster, your fancy Manhattan psychiatrist called. Everyone in the room was listening. Musgrave checked his clipboard. Did ask a Lena phobia? That's a mouthful. Fancy way of saying you don't like school. That's a thing now? When did that become a valid excuse? That's confidential student information, Digby said. Excuse me, Musgrave said. I'm pretty sure she told her parents you read all of that to her classmates. They'd call their fancy Manhattan lawyer and sue you and the school board for violating her privacy, Digby said. Still a troublemaker, Musgrave said. I remember you were fractious and disruptive to our investigation. Nothing's changed, I see. And that might be more confidential student information that you're revealing, Digby said. Musgrave's left eye twitched, but thank God, please call me Steve, called him to the other end of the room. What are you doing? I smacked Digby's arm. You wanted him to announce your private business to the whole room? Digby said. Stop helping and get away from me. Please, I don't want him to think we're friends. Don't knock it. Spend some time in River Heights and you'll know it ain't easy making friends around here. I'm serious. I can't get in trouble. I need a clean transcript or I'll never get out of here. Which makes your decision to skip school super interesting, Digby said. Are you transferring out of this fine establishment? I hope to. Where? A school in New York, the Prentice Academy. Ooh, sounds uptight. It's a feeder school for Princeton. Princeton? You want to go there? He was laughing at me. Not that I have to explain myself to you, but I have the grades. Your answer to having school phobia is applying to a really hard school so you can get into a really, really hard college? I'm not phobic anymore. Were you ever really... Digby took a bite out of a cookie. Hey, these cookies are pretty good. Uh, yeah, the guidance counselor made them. Wait, he said he physically made them? Yeah. Digby rifled through the tray of cookies. A few of the kids standing around us groaned in disgust. You're touching all the cookies. That's totally gross, I said. Across the room, Steve and Musgrave argued loudly. Want to get out of morning class this semester? Digby said. How? 
Think fast. Steve's losing against Musgrave. Are you in? Now or never, Princeton. I meant to say no, but as I later found out, something about Digby makes me do exactly the opposite of what I know is the right thing over and over again. I guess I'm in. Digby ran over and inserted himself into their argument. Steve, I gotta talk to you about our independent project, Digby said. Steve looked blank but played along. Oh? What independent project? Musgrave said. Our approval form's right here, Digby said. It, it's new, Steve said. Students work on projects off campus to pursue interest in curriculum that doesn't address. They don't come to school, Musgrave said. Well, they meet with a faculty advisor, but they work on it outside the classroom. They come to school for the rest of their credits, Steve said. That's ridiculous. That's kids schooling themselves. Blue state liberal coverage. What is this project anyways? Digby used his extra board expression. We're calling it convicted in absence. We're looking to whether skipping class leads to criminal behavior or whether being punished like a criminal for skipping class actually causes criminal behavior. I bet it's a second one. It came out fast and shiny, like he'd spent time polishing up his spiel. We're talking about securitization. Schools as an extension of the police state. Convicted in absence. Good title, right? This crap is destroying this country, Musgrave said. And that sealed it. Anything to annoy Musgrave, Steve signed the form. I caught up with Digby in the hall. What just happened? How did you do that? I asked. Manhattan psychiatrist, but downgraded to a fallen down house in a B-grade suburb? Your parents are divorced. Come on, you never use the divide and conquer? It's a divorced kid classic. Digby looked at me hard. Although no makeup, no piercings, loose jeans, he looked at my butt a little too hard for my taste. I don't see a whale tail. Good girl who doesn't play that game. Yeah, that's you. The girl in the music video before the makeover. Half the school's got divorced parents. You had a 50-50 chance, I said. And what was with that cookie thing you did? When mommy or Steve in this case, Lies about store-bought cookies being homemade. It means the battle for the kid's affection's not going well for her. I gave Steve a way to win the battle, he said. How'd you know those weren't homemade? Unless they're OCD. People don't use cookie cutters on chocolate chip cookies. Perfect circles. He held up the cookies that he had swiped, all unnaturally round. Plus, he really cares. They're warm, so the guy actually microwaved them. Great, Professor Pillsbury. But now we have to actually write this. Read the room. Steve will give us a good grade no matter what we turn in. Just a freak out, Musgrave, he said. What's with you, anyway? What do you mean, what's with me? The psychiatrist? What, bipolar, plain vanilla depression, rainbow sprinkles of phobias and anxieties? What's your deal? That's personal. It's like you can't get out of bed because you feel like someone's sitting on your chest. But who cares anyway, because what's the point, he said. Or like you can't be around people because you feel like everyone knows. Fine, I skipped class a bunch when my parents were divorcing, but dad said it'll look bad on my transcript. So he called a psychiatrist friend and I'm a fake, okay? <sighs> Just because your psychiatrist notes fake, it doesn't mean you're not really depressed. I hadn't considered that. But hey, Digby continued, your dad's got a medical professional who's willing to falsify medical records for you. That's pretty handy. He pointed at my earrings a pair of big diamond studs. I'd wondered if I shouldn't wear them to school, 
But when he gave them to me, Dad had insisted that I never take them off. Is that part of the official uniform of Team Dad? And when I winced, he said, Just kidding. They're beautiful, Princeton. Digby turned and walked away. Hey, wait, now what? I said. I'm going to check out the cafeteria, he said. Zoe Webster, right? You have school email. I'll email you. And then I didn't see or hear from him for weeks. Oh, gosh. So chapter three and on, I'll let that be a surprise to you. But let me just say, I enjoyed this book so much. I really want it to be a movie. And since I do have a film club that makes book trailers, we did make um, a trailer for this book using act people who wanted to be actors when we did Casting Call. And uh, we tried to uh, make the most authentic we could to the book. And the scenes that are in the book trailer are shortly after the, um, you know, in the like chapters three through five or something like that. So it's not going to give away anything. Hopefully it'll even make you want to read the rest of the book more. All right. So thank you for listening and watching and have a great week. Happy Friday.